For 25 years, Barbara Lee has fought to change the face of American politics and elect women to political offices long dominated by men. Here in Massachusetts, she's helped launch the career of so many trailblazers, including Governor Moore Healey, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Congresswomen Catherine Clark and Ayanna Presley, and Boston Mayor Michelle Wu, just to name a few. It all started a quarter of a century ago with the goal of helping elect the first woman president of the United States. Now, Lee's first campaign in 1998 named Hillary Clinton as one of several names put forth for that job. And Lee would go on to be one of Clinton's biggest donors in 2016. Well, now the philanthropist and political powerhouse is getting ready to hang up her hat, announcing plans to wind down her foundation and her work by the end of next year. So joining me now to reflect on her legacy are Amanda Hunter, the executive director of the Barbara Lee Family Foundation, and Erin O'Brien, an associate professor of political science at UMass Boston. Welcome. Great to be here. Thank you. So Amanda, I mean, in researching this, this is a staggering number here. More than 200 women in 37 states. Barbara has gotten elected to office since 1998. Incredible. But we were talking about how the landscape has changed a lot in that time. Absolutely. And, and they say that you don't often get to thank your heroes. And I've been fortunate enough to get to work with one of mine for the last almost seven years, truly because Barbara really has always done this work because she wants to see a woman president. And, and that is really her goal. And that number doesn't include all of the women that she supported who were not successful in their elections either. Just to set the stage, in 1998, there were only 63 women serving in Congress. Today, there are 150, more than twice as many. There were only three women serving as governor and now there are a record 12, and only 18 women had ever been governor in history, and now we're up to 49, so there's still some room for growth there. But when you look around, Barbara's influence is truly everywhere. That's certainly for sure. Erin, uh, let's talk about some of the barriers to entry for women, especially in the political arena. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of them still remain, but organizations like Barbara's made a real difference. It's still that women uh, run for office later. Uh, young people start out as equally uh, interested in politics, but as they age, as they go through school, women's ambition or girls' ambition drops. That's because of political socialization. It's not because girls are less ambitious uh, from jump. Uh, women, as I said, start later because they're still disproportionately responsible for family, both uh, uh, their kids as well as parents. So there's still a lot of barriers there. But what Barbara and the foundation has done, one of the barriers is no longer the idea that women shouldn't be running for office. Uh, mass publics, regular voters are willing to vote for a women, women, and they don't really think second about it. Now, they're not just going to vote for you because you're a woman, but women are viewed as viable candidates and they get as much money. It used to be that women had a harder time raising money. But again, via the foundation and groups like Emily's List, women can raise money on par with men. Amanda, with Barbara winding down her efforts, there has to be some sort of group that's going to fill that void. Certainly things have gotten better. We are seeing more women in office, but they're still going to need that support. Uh, they're still going to need that person that's going to slip that note in their pocket and say, you're smart. You should run like Ayanna Presley uh, recounts at her uh, meeting Barbara at a uh, event at Harvard. Well, you're absolutely right. And one reason that Barbara started the foundation was to do nonpartisan research to understand voter bias when it comes to women's gender and women's race. And so many women and academics have benefited from that research. And she's really given language to women's experiences that didn't exist before. Things like the likability tightrope that women have to walk or the imagination barrier because a majority of voters still picture a man when they picture a governor. Back when Barbara started this work, people weren't talking so openly about these barriers. And now we see it everywhere, including in the Barbie movie. A lot of America <laughs> Ferrara's incredible monologue really reflected so much of the work that we've done at the foundation. So we're really proud that we've 
influence the conversation. And as part of the sunset announcement, we are also going to be distributing support to a number of colleague organizations. So when Barbara started, there wasn't the infrastructure of groups to support women like there is now. And Barbara announced $2.5 million in support to a number of nonpartisan and educational groups that support women running for office to mirror our 25 years of work. It's so interesting that term you said, the imagination barrier. And as you're reading the accounts, like we mentioned, Ayanna Presley, Moore Healy, like didn't even occur to them that they could run and then have gone into their offices and in Presley's case, you know, won re-election. And in uh, Moore Healy's case, went from AG to governor of Massachusetts. How important is it to break that barrier, Erin, uh, when we're talking about the political landscape and sort of the also the psychology of politics? It's vital. Uh, first, women, as we've talked about, still need to be at, they're more likely to need to be asked to be encouraged, that imagination. But once they're asked, look what women can do here in Massachusetts. And uh, what I love in part about the foundation is, uh, yes, it matters. It feels better to have a government that looks like the citizens, including women, women of color. So that is important, that descriptive representation. But what the foundation and myself and scholars of women in politics point out, it's not just a feel-good prerogative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's because policy outcomes change when women are there. It be Policy becomes more representative of the whole of the population, and women bring up issues that men might vote the same on, but they put them on the agenda. There's a different agenda setting space. So that's why it's not, it does feel good and I love feeling good, but it also matters for democratic outcomes and the kind of policies to be reflective of the whole of the population here in Massachusetts and in the country, of course. Yeah, and I'm thoughtful of the conversation around that woman voter that has become increasingly more important. And I imagine that you can attribute some of that importance to the work that Barbara's doing with some of the other nonprofits in this infrastructure. And Amanda, I'd love you to talk a little bit to that. It's so important, and we found in our research again and again, to remind people that women are not monolithic in the way that they vote. And women often, just like all voters, prioritize their ideology over voting for someone as a result of their gender. But where we have seen a big shift is with women's political engagement and even as being political donors, even giving a modest amount of money. One thing that Barbara has always talked about is empowering women to become involved in the process. And we did research on women voters with our partners at American University and found that even though women reported consuming the same amount of political news as men, they were 50% more likely to say they didn't feel prepared enough to participate in politics. So women still feel like they have to be overqualified, whether they're just volunteering on a campaign or voting, but it definitely... It, after 2016, we saw a big shift in the way that women were participating, and I don't think we're ever going back. As we look forward to the next election, which we already know has frankly already started, <laughs> Aaron, uh, and you see, you, hate, you see someone like, like Barbara sort of winding things down, other organizations trying to step into those very big shoes, right? What, what, do you, how, what kind of impact do you think that's going to have um, as we go into the next election cycle and especially the election cycles even tomorrow with the city council in Boston right. and then also as we, we look at uh, Congress and, and, and things in the Senate and things like that going down the line here? Well, I smiled in part because I'm an American University alum from that <laughs> Women in Politics program. Um, so, th and that's important because it's intergenerational. Uh, the foundation, I mean, we can't ask one person to do it all. That's right. right? <laughs> the foundation, she's a lot, she deserves a break. <laughs> um, and to pass that baton on. And importantly, uh, uh, Barbara and others have created an infrastructure. I teach women in politics. That's not a course that I had to add and fight for. It's a course that's recognized as, Im as important. And so that foundational work has been done. And there's a lot of individuals, women and men in my classes who care about seeing women in office. So I think we see that it's time for the generational shift 
and passing of that baton. But gosh, there's a lot of organizations, there's a plethora of talent that is working together and not against one another to move that forward. That's for sure. Amanda, I wonder you can share, and you probably have many Barbara stories, but one that, that comes to mind uh, that you might think is, is unique or interesting that you, you would like to share with our audience. Well, there are so many stories, but I think as someone who's been fortunate enough to get to work for her for over six years, she's also just such a delight as a boss and as a mentor. We were reminiscing over the weekend that she always has life advice for everybody. And even though she's about five foot two, she moves very fast. She was, a, she was a basketball player when she was younger. And she always wore flats and always encouraged all of the women on her team to wear flats as well and just to do what made them comfortable and to empower ourselves. And it's it's been really amazing to work in that type of an environment. I grew up in Massachusetts. I always was aware of Barbara and always wanted to work for her. But I never thought that I would have the opportunity to spend so much time actually doing so. And what a time in history to be able to do this work. Does she Can I share a quick one? Of course, yes. It's, this is a great one, I think. Um, so a good friend of mine was running for office and a local city council race. And she called me and said, do you know this Barbara Lee? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so now my like work life is with my friend life. And um, my friend knocked on Barbara's door just get out the vote effort. And Barbara's like, oh, come in <laughs> and totally coached her up just because my friend was out doing the work, knocking on doors and Barbara worked with her and helped her quite a bit. So like she walks the walk beyond the research. Yeah. And, you know, I'll give you the last word here, Amanda, in the last 30 seconds or so. What do you, do you think Barbara reflects on her own legacy or is she just like, OK, here you go. Here's the baton. Barbara also wants to be very clear that she's not totally leaving this world. She will still be engaged as a private citizen and cheering people on, maybe with her grandchildren running around next to her and maybe wearing different outfits, but she'll still stay engaged. But I think one of the biggest parts of her legacy is breaking down the imagination barrier. She's always called Massachusetts the original old boys club. When you look around, it looks pretty different around here than it did when Barbara started. And there's going to be a whole generation that's going to grow up never remembering a time there were then when there were not women and people of color leading this state, leading Boston, leading cities around the state. And that's where we're going to see transformational change in voter opinion. Well, thank you so much, Amanda Hunter and Aaron O'Brien, for your time. Thank you.